Thank you everyone for being with us today as we celebrate the week of prayer for Christian unity, uh, especially here in the Middle East. Um, as you know, church divisions over the world is a, is a major concern and we want to be unified together in our call to follow Jesus and to uh, um, share his love with the world. And we recognize at CMAP the beauty of many expressions of the traditions that seek to do that. And this week is just one small way that we um, try to honor and pursue that unity. Um, today, we are, um, firstly, I myself am Kevin Volrath, the manager of Middle East Partnerships at CMAP, Churches for Middle East Peace, uh, based it, usually in the Jerusalem area and today coming to you from Amman. And very happy to have with us Richard Sewell, who is um, the Dean of St. George's College. And I'll tell you a little bit more about him now. And then he will lead us in a brief devotional um, reflection on this year's theme of justice and unity. And then we will pray briefly and carry on with our weeks. Dean Richard Sewell is British and has pre previously served as a priest in the Diocese of Silerk in the UK. His last post before moving to Jerusalem was as team rector of Barnes Team Ministry, which comprises three churches in Southwest London. Richard was ordained priest on Feast of St. Francis in 2003, and he trained for ministry at SCITE, which is now St. Augustine's College. He also studied theology at the University of Birmingham for his BA, and done further studies at Haythrop College for an MA in Biblical Studies. Dean Richard, in addition to his role as Dean of the College, is a residentiary canon of St. George's Cathedral, Jerusalem and his honorary canon of Southwark Cathedral in his home diocese in the Church of England. The Diocese of Southwark is Dean Richard's sponsoring agency in his role as Dean. And we are very privileged to have him join with us today as well as um, work together for justice and peace in other capacities in the Middle East. So thank you again, Richard. It's my pleasure and it's a privilege to be with you and to share in this uh, wonderful initiative for the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity. And um, actually it's one of the great joys in Jerusalem. I always made a thing of marking the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity back in, in London in my parishes. But to be honest, it was a bit of a struggle getting people to come to evening or daytime events to mark the Week of Prayer. But to my joy here in Jerusalem, it's really a highlight because um, we have such great diversity of denominations of these Eastern Orthodox churches and Western traditions. And we love to come together to share in worship together and to have fellowship together. And so uh, each year that I've been here these last four years, barring one for COVID reasons, we have been able to gather together in different churches uh, of our city, of our, our beautiful but troubled city, uh, and to pray together for our unity. Uh, and so it's even more special to me now to have shared in it uh, here in the Holy City of Jerusalem uh, in a way that is really invigorating and inspiring. And um, so it's my pleasure to share in this reflection with you in that spirit of unity and of shared purpose uh, as followers of Christ. And it's wonderful to be able to reflect on this uh, short verse from Isaiah, to learn to do good, to seek justice. And the verse continues to say to rescue the oppressed, to defend the orphan and to plead for the widow. And these verses uh, imploring us, where God implores us, as his people to, uh, to do justice, relates closely, of course, to that famous, well-known and treasured verse from Micah, chapter six, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. These are what we are called to do, but the promise was first made to the people of Israel. And so we uh, claim that promise, and live sort of uncomfortably in, in it as well, 
because of the struggles that we participate in here in the land, the land of Israel and Palestine. Walter Brueggemann, in his magisterial work, The Theology of the Old Testament, said, Israel is put in the world for the sake of justice. And he goes on to say that it is an imitation of the practice or of the work of Yahweh. The people are called to do justice because it is the work of Yahweh himself. In Deuteronomy 10, verses 17 to 18, it says, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribe, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, who loves the stranger, providing them with food and clothing. And in Proverbs, it says, those who oppress the poor insult their maker. So our calling is rooted in the very nature and the work of God's self. And I think that's a really important reminder that we are not simply called to this work because God desires it. That would be in a way sufficient in itself but we are called to do it because it is God's work. It is what God desires. It is what God seeks to do in the world. But we know that God so often works through the lives and the commitments of those who seek to be close to God, to be lovers of God, in our case, to be followers of Christ. A profound thought, isn't it, that those who oppress the poor insult their maker, insult God, because we, we defy the very nature of God's self. But equally, it's an inspiration that when we do justice, when we love justice, and we are merciful, and we seek to uplift the poor, we are finding ourselves, we are walking in the very nature of God. And I find that something both encouraging and inspiring. The call to justice is usually seen in relation to those who are too weak to protect themselves. In the Hebrew Bible, that so often is the widows, the orphans, and resident aliens. In our own cultures, in our own time, in these days, we might want to add to that the refugees, unemployed people, homeless people. In the Hebrew Bible, injunctions to uplift the oppressed only really apply to those within the community of the people. The prophets were concerned with what happened within the people of God, within the nation of Israel and of Judah. But we cannot be that narrowly focused because we are aware of the needs of all the world. That is both the blessing and the burden of responsibility of our world, which is interconnected through modern mass communication, where news in one part of the world travels around the world in a matter of minutes. And so we have, in a way, an even greater burden because we cannot claim ignorance of what's happening in another part of the world. It's both a huge benefit, but it can also be completely overwhelming as we have that sense of the global breadth and the number of individuals and peoples whose plight must be highlighted and acted upon for all of us on this uh, zoom call of course the plight and the need of the palestinians is right up at the top of our commitments 
but we might also easily say and put alongside that the Uyghurs in China, the Rohingya in Burma, Myanmar, the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh, and so many others. And each one of us will have particular parts of the world where we feel a commitment and a concern and where our prayers focus over and over again. We might add to that ethnic minorities in our own countries, religious minorities in our own countries, native indigenous American people or indigenous peoples in many other parts of the world. The list is seemingly endless. And that can almost be a disincentive to get involved at all, because why should I care for any one of these disadvantaged people if I can't care for all of them? But we can't. We can't care for all of them. We have an injunction to strive for justice, to seek justice, to rescue the oppressed. But we have to act in the ways that we can within the limits that we have got. In addition to all those vulnerable people, we of course can't uh, be ignorant of the need of creation itself in the midst of a climate crisis, climate emergency, uh, and of um, desperate climate change. All these things are concerns. And some of them somehow are connected as well, and we have to seek to perceive the ways in which the oppressions of vulnerable people are connected by all sorts of ways, both, um, both obvious and obscure. Another danger that we might have is that we may be very alert to pointing out the failings and injustices committed by others and less able less keen to notice the oppressions and injustices that are right under our nose. It's often easier to see the failings of others to, than to see our own failings. The sins of, ease, of others are easier to see, and perhaps our own sins are more readily justified to ourself. To Isaiah's great credit, he addressed his own people's failure to live up to their calling. Not only that, but he was himself a part of the privileged elite, the ruling religious and political classes to which he was in some sense related, come in for the harshest of his criticisms. So he was prepared to separate himself from his own people, the elite, the, the well-off, the privileged, but also to speak into the very nature of his own people, the Jews of Jerusalem and of Judea. And considering the numerous external threats which Jerusalem and Judah faced in his time, in the eighth century of uh, the uh, uh, before Christ, it wouldn't have been entirely surprising if Isaiah and other prophets of their time, Micah, Zephaniah, and later Jeremiah, focused their attention on the, uh, on the aggressive and expansionist uh, habits and practices, the idol worshiping of their neighbors, but they don't. They keep a steely, sharp-eyed focus at home on their leaders and the deeds or misdeeds of the privileged. And so we too, inspired by the Hebrew prophets, mustn't lose sight of the injustices right under our own noses. We must not lose sight of the disadvantaged victims or survivors on whom our own privilege might be propped. But we also know that oppression on one hand and wealth and privilege on the other have huge international networks. They're entwined and mutually advantageous in multiple ways, 
multiple ways. The political elites and the super rich have all sorts of ways of exploiting the resources and the peoples of the world. And they often do not discriminate uh, as to where their wealth and their advantage will be uh, taken. And we, we are here. These few of us gathered this morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever we are, in one way or, an, or another, because we're focused on the challenges and struggles of the Palestinian peoples in this land where I sit right now, uh, but dispersed all over the world, where that cry for justice is proclaimed, but often not heard and often misheard, either deliberately or accidentally. So we, we concerned for the Palestinians of today, cannot read of the Jews of Judah or of Israel without also connecting it to the issues of today in Palestine and Israel. We hear these texts, texts, biblical texts, in their own original context, but in the context of our day to day, and that's as it should be, as it must be. So for instance, when I recently visited the ancient site of Tel Giza, about 40 miles west of Jerusalem, which is now simply an archeological site, I discovered that it was one of the Canaanite towns which resisted Joshua's invasion of the so-called promised land. Then of course, I felt some identification with the Canaanites as a dispossessed people, like the Palestinians who have been dispossessed in 1948 and 1967, and who continue to be dispossessed by home demolitions and by illegal settlements uh, right beside their villages. Contrastingly, as a Christian, we also claim the promises given to Israel in the Hebrew Bible. Since we understand the church in general and Christians individually as heirs to those promises, as people called to be light to the nations. Which, for instance, second Isaiah promises to the Jews when they're in exile in Babylon. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. That's Isaiah 49, verse 6. Yes, Yahweh called Israel to be a light to the nations. But we hear that as a calling to us in our day to be a light to the world because we know that Jesus was given as a light to the world and we are called to amplify that light in our own lives. Much to our own discomfort, if we wish to claim the promises, then the warnings are also for us too. Shortly after Isaiah's challenge, to learn to do good and to seek justice comes a word of judgment. I will pour out my wrath on my enemies and avenge myself on my foes. I will turn my hand against you, writes Isaiah, proclaiming the oracle of God. Of course, we here as Christians, we read and hear these words in the context of the grace of God, of the peace and reconciliation established through the incarnation, the death and the resurrection of Christ. But we should not imagine that our complacency, our empty words and worship, while we benefit from the exploitation of the vulnerable, is any more acceptable to God when it occurs in Chicago or Houston or London. 
than it was in Jerusalem or Hebron in Isaiah's day or today. If we are people who learn to do good and to seek justice, we must be deeply rooted in the righteousness and the peace of God. And perhaps in, Christ, in the week of prayer for Christian unity, we need to remind ourselves that Christians often find their best and holiest unity when we work together. Yes, to pray together, to worship together is a high calling. But might it also be in the spirit of Isaiah to say that it is an even higher calling when we work for justice together. And sometimes when we sit around and talk about what it means to be Christians of different denominations, we get caught up in our differences. But many of us will know in our own cities where we have lived and worked, that when Christians together open a soup kitchen or when they See, set up a legal counselling service for refugees, that their differences as Christians of different denominations come to seem to mean very little at all. For when we work for justice, when we strive for justice, we enter into the very heart of God because it is in God's nature to seek and to love the ways in which Justice can be given to the poor and the oppressed. So in this week of prayer for Christian unity, let us redouble our efforts to work for that justice and to be signs of that justice as we are also called to be a light to the nations. So would you like me to pray, lead us into prayer? That would be lovely. Okay. Let us pray. Oh God, we give you thanks for the scripture which reminds us of your nature and your calling and which has revealed to us your nature of truth and justice and peace and reconciliation. And we thank you that the written word testifies to the living word, Jesus Christ, who is that enduring light in the world and which has drawn us, for we seek the light. We pray, O oh Lord, that that light would shine within us and sustain us, even when it feels as if darkness is overwhelming us. Bless us with your grace, that we may be empowered through the gift of your Holy Spirit to overcome the things which disempower us, so that we may be encouraged, enlivened, inspired and equipped to do that work which you have called us to do and to be the those people which you call us to be that we might reside and be active in your very nature and unite us O oh lord as christians of different uh, tribes and hues of different styles and inclinations so that these superficial things may be no inhibitor to our unity but that we may be in the gift and grace of your Holy Spirit united in work, united in striving for peace and justice, especially we pray, for we know that it is in your heart for the living stones of these lands of Palestine and Israel, that they may be 
lifted up, along with all Palestinian people, that their cry of justice would be heard and their just cause be realized in your good and gracious time. This we pray in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, Dean Richard, there's so much I'd, I'd love to respond to in, in what you graciously shared. Um, a number of scriptures were coming to mind and uh, some other theological points. So thank you very much for that thoughtful reflection and reminder and call to action for all of us. Um, and thank you to everyone who has joined us this uh, morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you are. I uh, appreciate your presence with us as well as your prayers uh, for unity in a difficult time in the world. So blessings on the rest of your week and um, all of your efforts for justice and peace.